Okay, today we're going to be talking about um, the more radical phases of the French Revolution as well as the rise and fall of Napoleon Bonaparte and how he kind of brings order back into France. So make sure you've got your notes with you um, for the moderate phase, continued, radical, and Napoleon. Okay, uh, just to bring us back remind us where we came from. Um, we have finished talking about the three estates in France and the financial crisis. Um, we have the meeting of the Estates General and the establishment of the Tennis Course Oath, which is going to um, abolish, get rid of the rights in the nobility, and establish France as a constitutional monarchy. Um, here is an artist rendering of the tennis court oath. You can see the revolutionaries. They're even coming in, hanging from the windows to see. And you do have some members of the first and second estate that agree that there needs to be reforms that join, but it's primarily composed of members of the third estate. And King Louis is pretty nervous about this, so what he does is he actually puts mercenaries outside the palace at Versailles. Um, he's kind of nervous, not sure what's going on, so he puts guards out there. Well, when he puts the guards out there, it makes his people, the citizens of France, nervous. There are rumors spread that um, the foreign soldiers are going to attack the peasants. So, on July 14, 1789, your Paris urban workers, the sans culottes, um, attack the Bastille, which is the government prison. Um, the Bastille is rumored to, it's where they believe the ammunition was kept. Um, that would be used to stop the people's rebellion. So Bastille Day is pretty much like France's version of Independence Day. They celebrate it every July 14th. Um, and just a reminder, the sans culottes, um, those without knee breaches is what it means. So the sans culottes without knee breaches. So they don't have the luxury of the nobility and instead the revolutionaries wear the longer trousers. Um, when they storm the Bastille, the revolution starts to spread outside of Paris and spreads into the rest of France. Um, rumors spread wildly through France so peasants take up arms and attack nobles. Um, here is the storming of the Bastille. It's um, one of the pivotal moments of the French Revolution. It's kind of like our Boston Tea Party. It's what's kind of celebrated as one of the big moments. Which leads us to the radical phase. Um, there are several changes through the, as the French Revolution evolves that makes it much more radical. Um, this is when we start, when we um, have the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, um, which promotes equal rights and limits the power of the king, guarantees rights like liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression, guarantees equal justice, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. Um, The National Assembly, which is like France's parliament, one of their big reforms is to take over the church land and declare that um, church officials and priests are to be elected and paid. Church land is nationalized, so it goes back to the government. And a lot of your conservatives, your peasants who are very strongly religious, absolutely hate this. And then one of the main things that happens is um, King Louis and Marie Antoinette try to escape France. Um, King Louis believes that there are people that will help him and they'll sneak him out of the country. When in reality what happens is they get stopped at a border check basically and it's discovered that it is King Louis and it, the peasant that finds him is not happy. They see him as abandoning them, running away. And when Louis and Marie try to leave Paris, that pretty much seals their fate. They're brought back into the Bastille and they're imprisoned. So, the reign of terror um, intensifies when Austria and Prussian rulers invade France to stop the revolution. Um, 
all the countries around France are watching the situation with a very close eye. They are absolutely terrified that these revolutionary ideas are going to spill out of France and threaten their own um, monarchies. So Austria and Prussia rulers invade France. Um, you have political factions that develop. You have the nobles the who are immigres. Nobles and others who have left France trying to undo the revolution and go back to the way things were. And then you have the Jacobins who are much, much more, much more radical. Um, they take control of France. Um, France is in, ends up being run by the Committee of Public Safety, which is led by Maximilien Robespierre. Um, the Committee of Public Safety is kind of an ironic name because they are the ones um, that are basically running the show, the execution. Um, during this time, anybody that's seen as an enemy of the revolution, whether you are um, speaking out in support of the king or um, challenging Robespierre leadership, you would be sent to the guillotine. Um, it said that the enemies were tried in the morning and guillotined in the afternoon. Um, the guillotine was kind of seen as like an enlightened form of execution because it was fairly quick. Um, it was said to be fairly painless. And all in all, over 40,000 people met the guillotine during the Reign of Terror, including um, King Louis. So, um, Maximilien Robespierre also meets the guillotine. Um, he becomes a victim of his own revolution. And the, end, the Reign of Terror ends in 1794. And they find this very bright, brilliant general that rises up through the ranks of France's army, Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, Napoleon is super popular. Um, he's a military genius. Um, he has... He's joined the army of the new government, so he's kind of like this hero of the hour. Um, because when royalist rebels march on the National Convention, Napoleon is there to defend them and defend the new government. Um, but um, what ends up happening is he has, he establishes this coup d'etat, which is a military takeover eventually. Um, 1799, Napoleon declares himself emperor. Um, through this coup d'etat, and what I think is very symbolic of Napoleon and his, um, I guess, ego, maybe, is that he crowns himself emperor. Um, it said that in his coronation, he actually took the throne from the um, Pope at Notre Dame Cathedral and places the crown on his own head. So, um, he's kind of like the Kanye of French kings because, like, tradition says that the Pope crowns the Emperor. Napoleon takes the crown and puts it on his own head. Um, very arrogant, which you kind of have to be to be a major general and establish a ginormous empire. Um, Napoleon has a few goals. One of his goals is he has um, two goals. He wants to control all of Europe and reassert French power in the Americas. He accomplishes one of these goals. Um, after the Haitian Revolution, Napoleon cuts his losses in the Americas and instead focuses on Europe, where he is really successful. By the time his empire falls in 1815, he's created the largest empire since the Romans. Um, his empire stretches from Spain all the way into Russia, controls basically everything except for Portugal and Great Britain and Europe. However, it expands so fast that it's unstable. Um, he's stopped when he invades Russia. He invades Russia in the late summer and is expected to be out of there very soon, but 
um, classic blunder, underestimates Russia. Um, he gets stuck in Russia in the winter, and as the Russians retreat, they practice a scorched earth policy, which means that they are um, burning the crops, killing the livestock as they retreat. So as the French advance, they have nothing to eat. When Napoleon does eventually make it to Moscow, um, the city's in flames, and he goes in with, I think, 300,000 troops and comes out with, um, he goes in with 420,000 troops and he comes out with 10,000. So massive casualties. That's a huge loss. Um, but one thing that he establishes that lasts is the Napoleonic Code, which is his kind of system where he says that everyone's going to be equal before the law. Um, we're going to have a meritocracy. We no longer have the nobility. You earn your positions through your good work, through proving yourself, through, you know, works, what you've accomplished. But he still limits a lot of our freedoms. Um, he does not like freedom of the press. He does not like freedom of speech. And freedom of assembly is restricted because these are seen as threats to his power. So he does kind of clear up some of the legal codes that have been, um, kind of all mixed up in France. Um, they have a uniform set of laws and they've eliminated a lot of injustices but it promotes order and authority over your individual rights. And You have the quote, I don't know if you can see the whole thing here, but it says, if the press is not controlled I shall not re remain in power three days. So he knows that if the press is free that it's going to be a challenge to his authority. Here you have a comparison of King Louis and Emperor Napoleon, and you can see that, you know, in 20 years, not a lot has changed. Um, Louis has, sitting by the throne, he has these elaborate, very plush robes, and here Napoleon is sitting on the throne, he has robes of velvet, he's got his scepter here, so it's still showing that, you know, we have total control. Um, Napoleon, though, can't sustain his empire. Um, he gets exiled once, um, after, um, losing to, retreating from Russia, he gets exiled. Um, he escapes exile because people want to restore him to France. When he's exiled the first time, um, they restore the Bourbon monarchy. Louis the Sixteenth's brother comes to the throne, and the French are totally against having anything Louis the Sixteenth, you know, Louis related. So they actually help him escape, and he comes back. Um, and his last big push for power is called the Hundred Days, because um, it only lasted that many days. It's very creative. Um, but British, the French, the Prussian troops defeat, or not really French. But the British and the Prussian, Russians, Austrians um, defeat Napoleon at Waterloo, where he is exiled a second time to St. Helena Island in the Atlantic. So they send him much further away this time, where it's harder to escape. And he eventually, he dies on that island, um, probably of cancer. It was a stomach exile. So um, six years after he's exiled, um, he passes away. And... What happens at the end of this is um, France restores a constitutional monarchy. We are no longer absolute. The monarch's power is limited by this document, by legislative assembly. Um, and with this, the few rich men that remain in France are the voters. Um, And they keep the Napoleonic Code to because you know he did establish this uniform, very cohesive set of laws. And once Napoleon is out of the picture, your other leaders of France, the ones that were most threatened, like Austria, Prussia, Russia, Great Britain, and France, meet together at what's known as the Congress of Vienna. And they have a couple goals. Um, they want to contain France to make sure that something like this cannot happen again. 
And part of containing France is to strengthen the countries around it. So what they do is they restore all of the old monarchs that were overthrown by Napoleon. Um, so all these displaced families come back. And at the end of the Congress of Vienna, in the middle of the 18, or early 1800s, um, 1814 to 1815, Europe is moving towards democracy, but hasn't fully reached it yet. Um, and that is where the French Revolution leaves off. You see some of the far-reaching effects. It's much more influential in Western Europe than what the American Revolution was um, as far as shaking up the balance of power in Europe and spreading these ideas of democracy throughout Western Europe. So make sure you guys have your notes with you when you come back on um, Monday. If you have any questions, bring them with you. And have a great weekend.